my core belief in sales is that you should be focusing on either progressing or closing, meaning discarding, disqualifying, and moving on an opportunity as fast as possible. I guess my philosophy around revenue leadership, revenue ops, sales management um, is first really focused on I guess, two different things, um, actively looking for, for problems and inefficiencies and really being open to and exploring and, and kind of turning over the rocks, so to speak, um, to, to go and find those. I think in a, in a you know, revenue leadership role, there's nothing is ever perfect uh, by nature. It can't ever be. And so I think that asking the questions, looking into the data, looking into the data, if it's even accurate, um, and really trying to, to find actively areas to improve, ideally tied to some of the, the goals, you know, and the, the objectives that the company has are really key. The second piece to that is when you're finding those problems, um, kind of the, the theme that I have is just trying to focus on friction reduction. Um, and so friction is obviously uh, something that can slow things down, can, you know, can create confusion, disruption. And so I think about if, if in my role, I can identify friction that our customers are having with our employees, our employees are having internally, um, that ultimately, the more that I can smooth out that friction, make it more streamlined with an eye on the customer outcome, then the better we're going to be. Um, but that, that's kind of the, the two main things, the themes that I think about when you know, I consider my style uh, as it comes to a, a revenue leadership. Yeah, fantastic. And knowing you, Chris, you do have this AE background. And from what you said, it sounds like there's so many similarities there, but I'd like to open up to you. Um, crossovers from being an AE, being in sales, and then treating your internal business as a customer, which is what you were mentioning in a second ago. Yeah. Um, so I think, you know, when I made the transition from an AE to a sales ops into a sales ops role, um, one of the things that stuck out to me is it's, it's, it's very much the same and I won't call it necessarily, it's a mix of account management and new sales. Um, and, and the reason is, is when, when you're in a sales role, many times you've got to be qualifying conversations and you have to have a, a really good threshold for, does this matter to anybody? Like, is this, is this impactful? Um, how high of a priority is this? And I think that it's, it's really, really key the same way in on the ops side. Um, you're asking questions to probe at, okay, this is a problem. I get it. How important of a problem is it? If, if I fix this, what's it going to do for us? In the back of my mind, if I fix this, is it going to be linked to any of the initiatives that we're hearing from the C-suite that they're focused on? Is the effort to fix this much uh, higher up than the reward to fix it. And I think using that sort of qualification skill that you get as an AE is just, it, it can be used throughout a company because you know, again, to ask that extra question, to, to really quantify the outcomes and, and tie it back to business objectives. And so I'd say that that's one of the, the, the key pieces. Um, the, the second piece is you've got to get stakeholder buy-in. And I think as an AE, you're all, ideally in, in most sales cycles, you're, you're multi-threaded. You know that you need to really get consensus or make sure that nobody's going to veto, you know, the opportunity. And so when you're thinking about projects or initiatives on the ops side, rarely does it only affect one department, one person. And so you need to be able to really assess who does this affect? How does it affect them? How can I make sure that what I'm doing isn't going to make their life or their job harder or worse? And then how can I in some ways, you know, get their buy-in and get their, their approval that, that they want to run with it and that they actually support it. And I'd say, you know, being able to, to quantify a problem, agree that it's important, and then to be able to take it through an organization to say, here's a little bit of what I'm thinking, tell me where I'm wrong, get their buy-in, get their guidance. It's always better because you don't want to be, and I think on the sales side, it happens when you, you know that you're sort of like selling into a department and another department's not really happy about it, or it's, it's kind of like, it's not, it's not their, their baby, so to speak, you get, you get roadblocks, you get things that are going to stop you. And so it's really important to get that consensus and buy-in internally, um, just like it would be externally. 
Absolutely. Yeah. I don't know if you use the term black knights in, in the US, in the UK. Yeah. That's what we do. Yeah. That's uh, essentially someone who comes in at the end of the deal who might scupper things you maybe didn't anticipate. But it's such a good point that we don't start to design the process or solution before we know there's buy in. As much as you felt comfortable sharing, do you remember a time when you thought you had the solution and the work in place, but actually that wasn't necessarily aligned with what everyone wanted? Kind of what was the scenario? What did you learn from this? Um, what did you take to your role today from that? Yeah, I, I, I think there's a lot of, there's a few examples of it, but um, I'll kind of take it back to the, the sales role. Mm -hmm. um, my core belief in sales uh, is that you should be focusing on either progressing or closing, meaning discarding, disqualifying, and moving on an opportunity as fast as possible. Um, and I think that it's really key that if you do that right internally, that you won't waste a lot of time, work, and effort, and cr frankly, just creating confusion because department A may think that you're doing something in sales, sales development may not be aware of it, and you, you just kind of create a lot of confusion. And so you know, I can think of a few scenarios where there's maybe a big initiative or a large project that maybe, you know, management above me thought was really important. Um, and you go and you explore it and you find sort of the high level, you know, alternatives and, and ways to address it. Um, and none of them, it's kind of the Goldilocks, like none of them are just right. Um, so there's nothing that I can say that really comes to mind as far as a lot of work and time invested. But I think ideally that goes back to is this important? Who's it important for? What's it going to drive? If you can answer those questions and, and start to get that buy-in early, you typically won't deal with some of the setbacks um, that kind of happen at the 11th hour. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, wanted to move the conversation on now to your background. Like we said at the beginning, you do have a really diverse experience. Mm -hmm. um, and this is a big debate at the moment. You know, do we look for people with diverse experiences, even if that means they've moved often, or do we like people to stay in one place? Yeah. Um, so I'd love you to put your argument forward, Chris, from your own experience and what that's given you and what you've learned. Um, and particularly when you're building a team, for example, of SCRs, mm -hmm. how you think of that as a hiring manager? Yeah. Um, so from, from my background, just, you know, kind of real quick, I started off my career um, it, at least in the, my, the corporate world, uh, selling copiers, um, which is a really difficult, anybody who's ever done it before or knows somebody who's done it, it's a really difficult commoditized sort of grinding sale with uh, an extreme amount of rejection. Um, I did that for about three years, but I knew that I wanted to get into the software space. Um, and so I, you know, through, through referrals and I'll kind of come back to referrals and, and why that matters in a second, um, ended up going into a, a firm that did Salesforce consulting and they were launching a product to the Salesforce app exchange. And so I had no experience in software, I frankly, didn't have, I'd never used Salesforce before. And so I had to really quickly get up to speed on what's the product, what's the platform and how can I start to align, you know, my vision. Um, we had a really successful launch. We, you know, I was there to get our first 10 customers, first 10 paying customers. But ultimately what I did is I ended up um, moving around a little bit. I ended up at some early stage um, social analytics companies. Um, and, you know, I went from, from one that was a series B that ultimately shut down. Uh, I went to another that was more in a seed stage that was uh, coming over to the US um, that ultimately recently also shut down. Um, and then, you know, ended up um, here, here at Wealth Engine. What happened though, is that those roles that I went to, almost all of them, I was referred. And the reason that I was referred is because I had a network of people that I had worked with. And in SaaS, tenures are really short, people move around. Um, and so really from, from my standpoint, I think that if you're, if you're focused on early stage companies, there's a lot of value from sort of seeing different perspectives, seeing different business models, seeing different problems, quite frankly, that the business is trying to solve. Because in many ways, what that does is it, it just, it helps to sort of train that muscle. It's that pattern recognition of what you're looking for, tells you what you maybe don't want to do in the future. But the key thing is that it expands your network really just exponentially, because the more that you work, people people move on. It's, it's short, a, a VP of sales, CMO, any of those roles are typically 18 months or so right now, they move on. And so that comes full circle if you do a great job. And I believe that when you're thinking about sort of your career and what you want to do, you could go the, frankly, the larger company route and, and that may be safer. 
you can you know put in some time and some years to to make that jump into management. Um, or I think that the earlier stage companies, there's there's often problems. There's often you know roles that are left unfilled that need somebody to come in and say, hey, I noticed nobody's doing this. Let me take it on. And I think what that gives people is just perspective um, outside of their roles, a way to shine. And when some of that sort of you know natural transition happens within a company, guess who they're thinking about potentially promoting internally, or guess who you know your your VP of sales that worked with you before that saw you do something in another role but thought, hey, you know what, Chris maybe would be really good for sales ops for us, even though he was an AE before. That gives you that sort of exposure that I think is is critical if that's the route that want, everybody wants to take or that anybody wants to take. Not everybody should go from sales to you know revenue management. Um, but if they do, there's 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 kind of a path to do it, uh, and I think moving around gives some of that exposure. Yeah, really I great. Threw, threw a bunch at you there, so I have no, to no. That. It's a great answer, but you you mentioned one thing in particular which actually really interests me, right? And it's this whole point of smaller company, a bit more scrappy, lots of opportunity, or bigger company, things are slightly more established. Obviously, we're simplifying things, but we can go with that for a second. Yeah. Um, to throw a dichotomy at you, I realize it's probably a false dichotomy, but if you are an AE and if you're thinking, well, I want to try out ops, or I want to try out something slightly different. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Enter a bigger company where there's more structure in place and maybe they can train you in the ways of doing things or take the risk and go where the opportunity lies and do something for the first time yourself. Like, where would you go if you were making that kind of decision? Which one might be better? Is there a better option? I, I think it totally depends on the personality, Th their risk tolerance, frankly, I think is, is really key in this and, and some of the confidence that somebody might have in, in their ability to figure something out. Um, you know, my perspective has been um, that these smaller companies offer opportunity because everybody's wearing a million hats. Yeah. Um, people move on and, and getting that sort of practical experience to go from, let's call it novice to, to good enough to potentially expert in, in different key areas, I think makes somebody more well-rounded so that they can then take on the, you know, the job of being in ops and having to be not an expert in everything, but to know enough or to know where to go to find the information or to, to create the formula, so to speak, create the machine and know some of the different pieces that go into it. And so I think if somebody's thinking about going into ops, going into management, there's a really good path um, on the, the larger company side. And, you know, frankly, you may be more like ready uh, for, for doing, you know, management and ops when you get there, but there's something kind of intriguing about kind of running and gunning, so to speak, and making it up on the fly and, and really, you know, kind of testing yourself to see how much you can handle um, when you're, you know, wearing a lot of hats at the smaller company. So that's, that's my choice, but I, I could see I could see a fair argument on the other side. I think it just boils down to the person and, you know, um, again, how much, how much they're willing to bet on themselves and also like, what's their worst case scenario? Um, you know, when, when I made some moves, I was, you know, I always think about the worst case scenario, like this company could be shut down. And, and I've seen that firsthand. I've, I've, I've gone through that. Um, to me, that wasn't so bad of a scenario because I saw that there'd be some value and some learnings about what not to do and, and what to look for next time. Some people aren't, they don't have that luxury. Um, they're, they're not, you know, sort of looking at it that way. So I, I think that that's really important is, are you okay with the worst case scenario? And do you think that, you know, what you can learn and experience um, can, can offset some of that? Yeah, it's a very fair answer. Really comes down to the individual and their background, um, which makes sense. Earlier, you mentioned a phrase, uh, pattern recognition. And I want to apply that to companies that don't make it because unfortunately many don't in SaaS and in tech. It, it just happens, unfortunately. Um, are there key themes, key patterns you recognize where businesses do fail that you are really hypervigilant of today? Um, yeah. What have you learned from experiencing and seeing that? What were the commonalities there? Yeah, uh, I love this one. So I, I think I've seen a few, few different things that have happened. Um, I think one, uh, first off, you, you have to have a product, in, in my opinion, that is, is getting high adoption. Um, and, and adoption is really key because it's always a, a leading indicator for churn, which is ultimately the financial metric that's going to really you know, dictate, in many cases, if a company can get an investment, what that looks like, uh, and how they can sustain themselves. Um, so I'd say really focusing on an adoption, in my 
sort of world and how I think of it is, how can you become a key piece of a workflow? Uh, how can you be everywhere that the customer needs you to be versus where you want them to be? And I think that's one of the things that I've seen in some companies is they're kind of, they're okay with the status quo of this is where we are, the customer will find us. Um, and they don't realize until too late that they need to be where the customer is with their product, with their experience in order to keep them engaged um, and keep them adopted. It's, it's usually the small things uh, that, that matter. It's a, it's a Chrome extension or it's a Slack integration or it's something that like somebody sees that really makes them feel like this is where I get work done. So I think that, that that's, a, that's one of the first things I've seen. I'd say the second is not knowing who your core customer is and building a product and building a strategy around, let's say, everybody. Um, I think that I've seen this one time and time again, where when you're in an earlier stage company, any dollars are perceived as good dollars. Building out functionality for that one client is worth it because we got to get the deal done. And you don't see until it's too late some of the debt that that creates. And you, it's there's an opportunity cost there. Um, and because there's you know, dollars in front of you from a sales side, it seems like the right thing to do. But as far as company building goes, it's really, really important to zero in on these personas at these types of companies. They are who we work with. That's what's most important to us. Will there be exceptions? Will there be a, an opportunity to expand? Absolutely. But until you've nailed that core piece, it's really hard to start to you know, get more of that exponential growth. And that ties into back to adoption, churn, how do you manage it? So I think those are those are probably the two biggest things that I've seen is trying to be everything for everybody um, and, and not really building a strategy so that you know you are involved in the customer's day daily um, based on how they use your product. Yeah, okay. Trying to be everything for everyone and not being where they need you to be for those that certain sector. Yeah, yeah. makes a lot of sense. Telling them where they should be when they're telling you pretty clearly with <laughs> their, their behavior where they want to be. No, it makes sense. And it takes a lot of bravery, right, to decide, no, actually, this isn't the best course of action if you have that that juicy closed one dangling in front of you, perhaps. Yeah, understood. understood. It is. Um, I think sometimes you hear the, the old Henry Ford quote I uh, used as a, you know, well, you know, I listened to what customers told me they would have, I would have given them faster horses. Um, sometimes it gets used as like to, to sort of, you know, argue the inverse of it, but, you know, it's, it's really important to, to take that customer feedback and, you know, understand the core problems that they're trying to solve and take care of that first. Um, and, and then you can start to expand outside of, you know, where they're, what they're looking for. That's great to hear. And like you said earlier, this is the benefit of experience and diversity and, and background. Um, final question for you then, Chris, if you're in a room full of RevOps, sales ops leaders, sales leaders, partnership leaders, whoever you're most interested in. If you're in a room full of these folks, what would you ask them? What would I ask them? Um, you know what I would probably ask them is, is if I think about you know, those, those leaders, in, in many cases, they're tasked with creating change. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I would ask them about how they best go about you know, creating change and change management. Um, change is difficult. It, it stresses people out because it's not how they've always done things. Um, and I think that being able to have a good strategy for creating change, driving a narrative, giving visibility to why we're doing something is something that, uh, again, you're in many of these cases, if you're brought in as a new sales manager, VP of sales, rev ops leader, in most cases, you're there because something's not working and change needs to occur. And so I think being able to, to ask some of the, the brightest minds about how they go about change management um, in kind of that step-by-step -step process is probably one of the things that would be um, most useful for me personally that um, I think I've done an okay job, but there's no, there's always room for improvement. Yeah, brave, brave and honest answer. Appreciate that. Um, yeah. And I like the way you frame being in a leadership position as being brought in to solve an issue, problem, or challenge. Um, it's a good way of simplifying what might run your day to day, like what to focus on. Yeah, that's awesome. I, yeah, I think um, you've got to love problems to be an effective manager or an effective person in ops. There's no you. You must love and encourage to find those problems, um, both for yourself but also for the people around you. I think it's a, a key component to, to being successful there.